So this is the last uh, of the last panel. Uh, we try um, to be, to a large extent, I'd say, um, flexible and ready to take on any challenges. And I want to thank Roman for taking the challenge to, to join us in this impromptu sort of panel. Um, so what we do is that we're going to spend about 10 minutes maybe playing the game to see how it is. Um, and you get to see the game as well. And then we uh, have a chat about how you see the future. Um, a Jedi to my left and a futurist but um, foresight expert, as you said. So I'm going to start off with the game. Uh, have you played the game? You played the game? You played the game? I had the, the opportunity to play the game Lovely. a few hours left. So this is a better version, obviously, right? So we have here 40 cards. Some of them are trends. Some of them are questions. So uh, I don't know how to mix such huge cards, but um, just pick one. Outlier, outlier. Not yet. I'll pick a purple one. You pick the red one. I'm going to pick one. You know what? <laughs> I'm going to pick one. I, so, um, is your mic working? Yeah, let me give it a shot. Yes, well, not that much. <laughs> uh, if I can get a functional mic, that would be good. So I'm going to so start uh, with, with Simon. Simon, what do you have? So, very much in line with the, what Dinesh just talked about, my card says more and more holidays happen in VR worlds. Ah, Dinesh, I think this is for you. And I'm not even cheating here. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your take on this? Very, very interesting. And it, um, it actually, it, it, it plays into it. Like the whole metaverse thing is obviously something that, that a lot of people talk a lot about and try to sort of grasp. And right now, I'm really caught up in the whole thing around, as we're seeing technology and immersive worlds and whatnot becoming more and more seamless, more and more frictionless. I'm actually be, becoming more and more concerned or engulfed by maybe we need to use some of these tools to not only design for frictionlessness, but also design for friction. So that, for example, instead of just popping on a, a pair of VR goggles to travel to Japan or whatnot, then, uh, because that's very frictionless, you're not really being uh, challenged or targeted or anything, you're not really having a opportunity to develop, to learn, or to, to, to be challenged uh, by different cultures. If, if we could sort of design that friction into experiences like this, instead of just talking about how easy it becomes and how convenient it is and how seamless it is, I think this would, would, would become much, much more interesting. Then we also have seen, obviously, in mentioning Japan again, we have seen, we have seen uh, different experiments, if you would call it that, business models even, where you actually think, or you, 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 um, you're going into an airplane, but you're never really flying anywhere, but you're having this experience that, that you're actually flying to a new destination and experiencing that, so it's not something that's completely new. Uh, and I think I can attest to this, actually. I think that, that might be something that we're seeing more and more holidays in, in VR worlds, cool, cool. but not completely taking over. Yeah, so, so the game, by the All way, right. um, is not played the way we're playing it now. Um, okay. Uh, because, <laughs> because now you should all talk about the same topic, but for the sake of, of the game, right, because the game needs to be flexible and the future futures uh, are. Uh, what do you have there? The great thing about seat walking? Okay, now, so VR vacations, we would avoid lots of COVID cases, but that's another uh, subject maybe. In my case, so it's what are the essential skills to master in the next three to five years? And uh, well, that's a wonderful question because I think there are lots of uh, young and bright students uh, in, this, in this room. Uh, but maybe I'll start with a bit of a tautology, which is the fact that the most important thing probably in the next uh, uh, decades, actually, it will be the, 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 the possibility of the, the capacity of people to learn, to relearn new things uh, every three years, five years, ten years, because we'll have so many, uh, so many uh, uh, businesses that will be disrupted. I mean, we looked at education uh, previously, and uh, if I were a teacher, I would be a bit worried maybe about uh, the way I would teach kids in 10 years, or 20, 50 years, or 20 years. And so you need everyone, you need teachers, you need students, and you need uh, 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 workers to be able to adapt, to, to learn new skills every time. Um, and then, I mean, the, the, 
the future sometimes it's very exciting. Uh, in this case, I think it's probably uh, not that much disruptive. I think that we need you need to be able to to, to you need to be able to code a bit or to understand uh, the key the key uh, the key scientific uh, uh, challenges of today. Uh, maybe. Uh, I think we talked a lot about Elon Musk uh, 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 today, but there was one of his tweets which wasn't too much crazy, for once, and it was a good question. Uh, it was about whether or not uh, a CEO of a tech company needs to be an engineer or not. And uh, uh, I think it's a good question to ask ourselves, and I don't have the, 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 the answer actually. It's uh, if you want to, to found a startup, or if you want to lead, for instance, uh, Microsoft. I think we had the, the CEO of Microsoft Romania the, this morning. If you want to run Microsoft Romania, do you need uh, uh, to be a software engineer? Do you need to have clear IT skills? Or do you rather need to be able to, uh, to look at the big picture and to understand the big issues of today? Um, so uh, my two cents, I mean, uh, 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 one cent on the fact that you need uh, to, to master engineering skills, but one cent on the fact that you do not need maybe <laughs> to, to master them. So that's a big question, and I, uh, I don't know how to answer it. Yeah, I think, I don't think we can. If you want to catch on on, on that. Um, and again, not, not trying to cheat or anything, but I actually draw that exact same card uh, <laughs> when I was playing the game um, earlier. And did you look at what I was saying? Because I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, and, and adding a little bit to that would be, yes, talking about skills and competencies and how to gain them is important, but it's also important to think about what could be new formats and approaches to sort of facilitate this new wave, uh, new, new skill learnings and, and sort of bridge the skills gap. So the whole sort of industry, industrialized society way of thinking about doing five years of university before you work for 50 or 60 years as, as we grow older, I think it's becoming more redundant for a digital economy, digital age. It, it, it's much more sort of open loop as you also, uh, as you also attested to. Um, and also we are seeing that new players, we call them new players, are sort of entering the arena of education. So it's not necessarily universities or classical institutions that, that, that do all of the education, do all of the upskilling, uh, but we're also seeing tech companies really uh, coming into the scene. And I normally tease Danish uh, university, um, um, what do you call like people working at the university, because actually right now we have a Google learning hub right bang in the middle of Copenhagen in a physical store. So they're physically entering the sphere of higher education. And who would you rather learn SEO marketing from? From a, an old university professor or from the company who are the best in the world? Especially if it's something that you need to gain now and, and, and utilize now. Uh, I think the, the, the answer is usually quite uh, in your face. Um, I want to take this opportunity to tell you both that we at least have one school, maybe we have more, uh, in Romania where I think we do teach uh, the skills of uh, tomorrow or whatever because they're entrepreneurial skills. Um, this is the Entrepreneurship Academy and I'm, I'm happy to teach their uh, various classes and what we try to do that there, we don't always manage I think, um, is to get out of the logic of uh, materi, of, um, you get the point, uh, yeah, but in, you get the point as well. Um, and to, to not just learn about how to do business, but to actually do a business, create businesses and so on. So if you're a high school, uh, um, in high school now, check out what we do at the Entrepreneurship Academy. Uh, and this, I have a question uh, that says, is the global trading system in danger? Um, um, and I think the, the, I think the word uh, is, is wrong. I put it there, but I think it's wrong. I disagree with the question. Um, because I think it's always been in danger, but it's always been in transformation. So if you take uh, Vasco da Gama's travels or uh, Middle Eastern explorers of the 14th century, etc. Um, you could, if you go back 500 years ago, you could say yes, it's in danger because somebody's trying to kill somebody else, and this happens now as well. But if if we were to to not talk about Ukraine um, and talk about the global trading system, it is in 
a continuous and hardcore transformation, mainly because um, the actors that make the world economy are not cooperating that well. So if you talk about the US, if you talk about China, um, and Germany, so um, in some parts of, of you know, Russia, of course, um, the World Trade Organization is not very functional. It's a highly bu bureaucratic uh, UN ecosystem. Um, it does work well when you go down to tariffs, but overall, um, there's, uh, I think it's in transformation, and to some extent, I think it's in danger, mainly because of its uh, complete unpreparedness for crisis. If you look at what happened with COVID, uh, we had shortages around the world because uh, there was no real procedure to inspect ships uh, to see if they need to be quarantined. Uh, we have now a huge challenge in the automotive industry where because of various types of challenges uh, and because we are dependent on Taiwan and China in particular, we can't make cars because we don't have chips. So that's why we need Maxim to print chips in space um, and so on. But um, for companies that are SMEs in particular, the global uh, trading system doesn't exist. But it has a deep effect on them. And they don't know that because most SMEs that I would know, or I guess we'd know, don't look outside their borders that much. They make VR heads, headsets, or they sell, or they do experiences. But if they would know that the global trading system or the, the routes are in danger because of chips or because of politics, maybe they would also reconsider. So you know, my conclusion is, uh, yes, it's in sort of a danger, it's in continuous transformation, and we all need to be better uh, equipped to understand how, how the, work, the world uh, works. Um, now, we're not going to play the game necessarily anymore, but I do have some questions for both of you about what you do and how you look at the future from a foresight perspective, from an innovation perspective, but it's the same thing sometimes. Um, so, tell us, you know, the, the institute um, that you work for, uh, started long before I was uh, born, I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, actually, we had our 50th anniversary a few years back. We were founded all the way back in um, 1969 by, at the time, the Danish Minister, for, um, minister of uh, for Finance, Torkil was his name. Torkil, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and that sort of t also tells the story about the field of foresight back then. It was a bunch of economists, a bunch of strategy, military strategists, and that really was how the whole field of strategic foresight grew. But today, like, we are in a completely different place where we would claim that we are multidisciplinary in the sense that I have a colleague that's a physicist, I have a colleague that's a sociologist, I have an anthropo uh, anthropologist as well, I have a business uh, training background, so, so that, that, that's sort of where we are now as a futures think tank compared to where we were way back then. We are actually competing with the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, in, in, in Silicon Valley, about being the oldest futures think tank. And it's something, I'm, I'm, I'm being told this all the time, but I forget it all the time as well, if I put the words in the correct order, then we are the oldest. So if I say that we are the oldest uh, independent, multidisciplinary, futures think tank, then we're the oldest. Yeah, for people looking into the future, you do hear a lot about the past. Not you, but uh, I understand. Um, but I do have a question about foresight and futurists. Um, for those of you that, that have some form of interest or curiosity, um, how I see it as a sort of a young entry and, and our colleagues as well that are you know, starting to really catch and fall, fell in love with this, um, there's a lot of dinosaurs in the market. For a, for oh, a, for yeah. An, hmm? mm -hmm. yeah. So for a, an industry that is focused on the future, there is a lot of conservative uh, approaches. Would you say that? And, and what do you think we can all do to change that? I mean, I can completely attest to that. We experience it almost every day when we work with um, like large organizations, both in the Nordics and, and, and around the world, that, uh, that some of these old systems, legacy systems, there's a lot of legacy out there, not only legacy in terms of old IT systems, old organizational structures, whatever, but also in terms of mindsets 
of people in organizations. Uh, so yeah, we encounter that each and every day. Um, is it easy to solve? No, it's not. Um, but I think, I think the merits of strategic foresight and the whole thing around uncertainty that I was talking a lot about this morning um, has really come forward as, as, as something that's... I mean, uncertainty is more pervasive than ever, it seems like, and in terms of strat strategy, businesses are facing sort of wicked problems. Organizations are facing wicked problems where there's, there's no simple solutions, no, there's no one solution, so you need to think in new ways. Um, have a lot of war stories that I'll be happy to share uh, maybe after this session, but uh, so oh my if God. You, if you want an intellectual, intimate moment, is that okay to say? <laughs> so intellectual, intimate, intelle let's call it intellectual. Intellectual <laughs> intimacy with Simon. You can uh, register uh, for tomorrow at 2. Uh, we have a longer workshop on Foresight, but we will have him for the first 30 minutes. So we're, we're setting up a, a rather small group of about uh, 12 to 15 people maximum to have a, an intellectual, intimate conversation. Um, because uh, what we see is that the, the more people can interact in a conversation, the more the conversation grows. Strategic foresight is a collective exercise. It should always be a collective exercise. You cannot really study the future alone and, and, and hope to learn much worthwhile. I will claim that any day. So yeah. it is a collective exercise. Now, um, Europe is also a collective exercise, a, a very successful collective exercise. Um, I'm sure a lot of futurists and foresight experts um, in the past 50 years some of them were, I don't know about Europe, this European Union thing. Uh, They're coming back, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so I would, I would go to Roman now and, and the, your mission and your colleagues' mission uh, at yeah. Jedi to make yeah. Europe great again. Yes, absolutely great again and making our planet great again as well. But I think that uh, <laughs> talking about Jedi or, 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 or making uh, Europe great again, we need to have a European perspective as well. So. Um, uh, but what to just say the fact that we need to, to, to leverage on uh, collective intelligence, uh, that's a key thing because, and then uh, uh, maybe I'll share with you a bit the story of Jedi, but we are a, a two years old organization and we were launched in the middle of the COVID crisis, actually. And uh, if you listen to experts, uh, if you listen to influencers such as uh, Bill Gates from three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, you had so many people telling us that we would have a pandemic and telling us that we were not ready, uh, that actually when you look at what was not being done, uh, you saw that a bit, a, a bit uh, as a missing opportunity. And uh, that's the reason, uh, a bit of the reason why we decided to launch Jedi actually two years ago, is that uh, um, uh, we already have, we already, I mean, within the EU, within Europe, they already have, we have uh, uh, civil societies doing this, uh, these foresight exercises. You have it within institutions sometimes, at the EU Commission, at the uh, EU Parliament. You have it sometimes at the, uh, at the, uh, the government level. But the issue is that um, uh, we need to do foresight, but at some point we need to act as well uh, on it. Uh, it's not enough to complain about, for instance, in France and big tech and to try to regulate it without being able to really uh, uh, put a limit to what they can do or cannot do. Uh, we can complain about the fact of foresight, the fact that the, the metaverse maybe will be totally shaped by, uh, by meta or by American companies. But at some point, our belief is to say that we need to, to, to act on it. And basically, so Jedi, uh, a quick word about it, about it for those who don't know, but we are a non-profit uh, foundation. And uh, as I told you before, so we do two things. And one of it is foresight in order to understand what are the, the next big things of, uh, of tomorrow. And we are not omniscient. We do not know. I cannot tell you that, uh, I cannot tell you that uh, this will absolutely be a game changer. But I can tell you that I listen to scientists who tell me at, uh, with 80% uh, or 90% of certainty that this might be a game changer. And uh, our goal so is to, co to capitalize on this uh, collective intelligence, first point. And secondly, based on this foresight, to launch grand challenges that can solve these issues. Uh, because uh, just look, for instance, at uh, just look at the example of uh, of, um, of social networks that I that I very much enjoy to to to, to use. It's been I mean it's been five years, ten years, maybe fifteen years that we've been talking about the negative impact that they can have. It's been five years, ten years, and fifteen years that we've tried to regulate them without that much uh, success. And uh, provide if we if we're able to shape today. 
uh, the next players of tomorrow, if we're able to, to, to fund the startups uh, that will uh, shape that and that will have, for instance, social networks that are abiding by democracy, uh, uh, by democratic value, then uh, we might, uh, we might, uh, we might in the end end up with a future that we want because I think foresight, it, uh, it boils down to that. It boils down to, to, to what might be the future, what you want the future to be, and how you make this connection between uh, both of them. So this is what, uh, what Jedi is about. Uh, can sometimes... Give, can, can you give us some, some insights? Because you said scientists tell you with, I don't know, 80, 90 percent... Uh, uh, so that's just an example, but you have... Uh, 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 when it comes to... I just talked about pandemics, but if you look at antimicrobial resistance, so you know the fact that antibi antibiotics are becoming less and less uh, 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 efficient because we overuse them, we know with quasi-centrality that in five years, 10 years, and, and 15 years, that there might be uh, some sort of a pandemic. I mean, it's not exactly a pandemic because it's not a virus, uh, but there might be what is called a silent pandemic. And this is something close to certainty if we do not act on it. And uh, I think that we, will, uh, uh, we would have... How, uh, do you, how do we act on it? So Do we this act is on it or is this so a it depends if I have uh, 20 seconds or 20 minutes or two months to talk about it but that's a big issue both politically and uh, uh, both uh, in terms of policy making in terms of science as well but to give you an example we need we need to come up with uh, uh, with new antibiotics uh, because currently, and this is where the, uh, I'm making the link between policymakers and, and businesses, currently businesses and, and pharma companies have no incentives to find new antibiotics because they're not being funded actually by, by governments, by the WHO and so on. And even if you look at the few uh, new antibiotics that are coming on the market, uh, they're actually uh, very, very, they're not innovative at, at all, that probably they're uh, more or less reusing the same, uh, uh, the same formula of before. Um, so on that, that's very much of a big issue. I don't have time to, to get too much into detail. Uh, but if you, if you focus on this issue, and if you're, you're able to, to, to provide a, a good incentive to the market, if you're able to focus on the right solutions, and if policymakers provide the right incentives for that, then you can definitely uh, shape the future that, uh, that you want. Lovely. We have about five to seven minutes uh, left, and we will be joined by the, the other room uh, shortly. Um, um, you, you, you come from, from Denmark and you come from France, and we're in Romania, so we're to a large extent... Right in the middle. Um, yeah, in, in Europe, right? Um, who is, is uh, not in terms of countries, but uh, when you look at Europe or the European Union, because it's, you know, it's, it's a different understanding sometimes, um, who do you think is missing from the conversations about the future of Europe that we are actually having or had at Brussels level or within the, the member states. If you're asking which stakeholders is missing in the conversation, I'm actually not sure I'm, I'm, I'm the one to, to answer that, to be honest, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> So, so it's difficult, maybe two elements. Uh, the first one is that uh, at the EU level, there's an EU commissioner, Maros Sefcovic, who's actually the uh, vice, uh, vice president of the EU commission. He's in, he's in charge of foresight and of the Brexit. And unfortunately, the Brexit is taking uh, uh, lots of his time. So uh, uh, that's a big of, of an issue, but he cannot dedicate enough, according to me, to, to, to foresight. But ideally, in a few months, uh, he'll be able to dedicate much more to that. So there's already, I mean, uh, stakeholders in, in big institutions that are looking at that. Um, secondly, what makes the thing very difficult is that if, I were in the, if we were in the US, I would tell you that we could definitely listen to startups, to, to big tech, uh, to the companies in between them, and then we would probably be able to, to think much more, for instance, about the future of technology. But since in Europe we are missing actually uh, a big tech, since startups sometimes have difficulties to, to scale up as quickly as they do in China or in the US, uh, it makes it very difficult. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg issue, a problem. Uh, uh, we would need to have uh, uh, much more powerful actors in order to have them being much more influential at the EU level or government level, so that we could have much more uh, startups uh, scaling up. Good. Um, and sort of the, the last um, question, um, or one of the last questions. You work with trends, you work with macro trends, you work with weak signals, uh, you work with the future and a variety of, uh, and a variety of tools, right? Um, if you were to pick one of the many, many methodologies or tools that Foresight um, uh, has to offer or offers. Uh, and you would 
I wouldn't say teach, but you would explain it briefly to you know young people, startups, um, maybe even medium companies. What would that be? I mean, the, the toolbox is so deep, um, and I think maybe I want to start actually by saying that that you don't need to be a big organization with a big setup in innovation or in foresight or whatever to be able to sort of benefit from doing strategic foresight exercises or futures thinking exercises. I mean, that can easily be done in a small team, innovation team, one workshop, whatever. Um, just saying that you shouldn't be discouraged if you're not sitting in a huge organization with huge uh, resources and whatnot to do this. Uh, there are a lot of tools that, that, that are pretty much plug and play for, let's say, workshop settings, uh, whether you want to be in sort of a more exploratory phase, there's, there's classical steep framework that you use to brainstorm uh, um, drivers of change based on. Um, I actually like not to, to, to sort of frame the an, ex, an explorative phase around steep, pastel, whatever you want to call it, uh, but using something that's called the futures triangle, where you're opening up more and you're talking about... A triangle obviously has three corners, very intuitive tool. In the one corner you have what we call the push of the present, right? So what are some of the evident things that are, that are driving change that, 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 that we easily see today, both in terms of technology and like society at large, uh, whatever. Then we have what we would call the pull from the future sort of where we really start looking at the margins of current thinking, weak signals, you, you mentioned it already. What are some of the, 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 the competing images in the future, maybe even? Um, and then we have the, the third corner, which is equally important, and, and something that we often tend to forget when we talk about the future and how things will evolve, the weight of history, right? Because again, back to my point earlier today, the future unfolds in sort of the friction field. Um, the future is very, very fluid, but the past is very, very sticky, right? So, so, so the way that the future unfolds definitely also depends on weight of history. While, let, let's say, looking 10 years out in the future, a lot of things might change, but a lot of things might not change as well, right? So I think the Futures Triangle is a good tool. I, I recommend the Futures Triangle as well. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, tools uh, for or, you know, setting the, the stage at the first time. Um, Roman, uh, we talked a lot about technology, we talked a lot about uh, blockchain today, etc. Uh, we talked about the great trading system and the grading system as well. Um, what is a topic that you feel is missing from the conversations at EU level or even business level? Or is there a topic that you feel we need to talk more about? Um, I mean, just w one example, I mean, it's hard because it's a great conference and with great speakers and uh, so many insights, and I think that uh, there are not that many blind spots, but uh, maybe I would, um, uh, I would have thought of chips if we hadn't talked about it, so I won't focus on that. But maybe thinking about quantum computing, because it's a good example of something that can totally disrupt the game. This is something that is still rather long term. I mean, we don't know if it will happen in 2025, 2030, 2035. There's lots of uncertainty about that. And actually, this is something about which we're pretty good at in, uh, in, in the EU, in Europe. We have good capacities. And this is uh, one of the industry uh, in which uh, China, for instance, uh, has yet to, 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 to make uh, breakthroughs. Uh, so I, I think about it in terms of, I mean, I'm pretty optimistic about the, the many applications that, uh, that uh, quantum uh, uh, technologies could bring. Uh, but then it comes to that, I mean, it's always the same, the same thing when you have a new technology, it comes with the other kind of impact and you need new technologies to think about it. And uh, during my keynote, I think at I briefly mentioned homomorphic encryption, but there's another kind of encryption that we need to think about, which is the uh, 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 quantum proof encryption, because pretty much quantum computers will be so powerful that will, that will break automatically, basically, the current encryption that we have. And this means, this is typically an example of what we should do. This is something that the, the, the US is very much aware of. You have the NIST, which is an institution that depends on the uh, US Trade Department, that for the last three years have, uh, has already been uh, trying to shape the future of encryption for 2030. Uh, so on that, two lessons. One is that there are technologies on which we are good at in Europe and that we need to, 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 to invest again uh, uh, in them. But second example, we need to think about the concrete applications of them and how to, 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 to react against that, even if it's in 10 years, 15 years, uh, 20 years. Okay. 
And uh, we have, let me check, three minutes left. Um, it is the first event that I've ever been to where time is to some extent um, uh, on, on spot on. And I am very happy about that. Now, um, in the last minutes, um, if you were to put um, a perspective out of the many futures that we could imagine um, about 2030, what would you say 2030 might look like? From, uh, from whatever perspective you feel like, business, technology, people, society, I think that's a Elon Musk, whatever. very, very fun exercise and actually something that we often ask our clients in, in a workshop setting. So come up with a radical scenario 10 years from now. Eight. Yeah. Eight, let, let, eight. <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, so you're asking me to come up with a radical scenario about anything that I just feel like. Yeah. Uh, oh my God, putting me on the spot here. I think, or I hope, at least, um, that we collectively sort of awake to the fact that uh, like climate, environment, it, it's something that we really need to start taking seriously. That there's there's no more uh, no more like messing around. And there's no more sort of hockey stick approach to, ah, we'll just wait for tech to sort of save us, then, and, and at some point it'll take exponentially off and we all good. It, it's something that, that's, that's important for all of us to, to take action on. So, so a radically different scenario would even be, preferable scenario, would even be that we are in a, um, in a future eight years from now where we actually on way to hit Paris targets. Um, that, I, I think that's radical because we're not at all on pace for that. It's not just radical, it's very courageous of you to think of that. I'm very happy, I would say the same oh, okay. thing. <laughs> um, same question, yes, but I would have a comment on that. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's a rhetorical question. How much of what's going on now in Ukraine is actually going to change the capacity to reach the global targets that we set? I mean, I, can, because, uh, I was going to be uh, as radical as you, which is to say that uh, one of the ambitions I think we could collectively have would be to reach the targets that we, are going to, we, we have set ourselves within the, the framework of the Paris Agreements. And when it comes to Ukraine, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the new milestones that have been that the EU Commission uh, uh, lately uh, uh, has been realizing, when you look at green hydrogen, at the, the, the fact that they want to scale up uh, solar panels, for instance, if we are able to reach those targets by 2030, because we have new numbers that have been set by, uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, recent statements, if we are able to, 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 to seize this uh, Ukraine momentum, that will be tremendous because unfortunately when it comes to COVID, I don't think that we, the fact that with COVID I told you about another silent pandemic which might be due to, the, to, to antibiotics, the fact that we're still talking about those kind of crises after COVID, this is a bit, of, uh, this is a bit disappointing in a way, but if after this, uh, this Ukrainian war, if we're able to really uh, 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 dedicate ourselves fully to the goals that we have implemented uh, 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 no later than one week ago, if we're able to reach that, it would be, I think, a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, example of uh, the way that we can uh, shape the, the, the future. Lovely. Can I elaborate yeah, yeah, yeah. quickly? Because I think this perfectly sums up how complex and how multidimensional uh, these conversations really are, because like you're seeing different uh, different movements. Like for example, the whole thing around uh, energy independence from Russia right now obviously is pulling in a direction that 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 opens up the window to really accelerate green energy, right? Sustainable uh, energy. And uh, yesterday, the Danish prime minister, together with Germany and 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 uh, Holland, the Netherlands, and, and and Belgium, they agreed to to like what they called it, the North Sea Treaty, <laughs> to, to, to put up a lot of uh, wind turbines off, offshore in, in the North Sea. That's an example of how things are being accelerated by what's the event that's currently going on. But the other hand, what about all of the uncertainty around supply chains, inflation? Is that going to come to the foreground, whereas the climate challenge is, is being pushed to the background? It's, it's so difficult and it's so complex and it's pulling in different directions. 
you, you, you throw yeah, it's, a ball it's just first. it's just saying that it's great to have new solutions, but let's do some foresight even about that when you think about the offshore wind turbines. Actually, they are using something called a permanent magnet, which is made out of metals uh, that uh, that comes from China usually, and this means that we we need not to jump from one dependency from Russia to another dependency from China. Meaning that even when we do some foresight and uh, and when we take decisions based based on this foresight, we need to to update our own foresight, and uh, uh, it's not easy, uh, but it's part of the, 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 the solution that we need to, 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 uh, to put on the market and in our societies. Lovely. Well, that was uh, very warm because of the lights, conversations, conversation, but also it was very, um, um, I'd say, um, warm, um, and thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts um, and, uh, and visions about the future or futures. Um, I want to thank you for staying uh, up to this point. We do have a couple of uh, minutes uh, until we actually end, but I want to start off by uh, thanking Romain and, and Simon for joining us on stage and uh, joining us uh, at Future Summit um, 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you.